the uh, Oregon City Transportation Advisory Committee meeting before January of 2020 will come to order. Kim, would you call the roll, please? Yep, Mr. Anderson. Here. Mr. Atkinson. Here. Mr. LaSalle. Here. Mr. McEnroe. Here. Mr. Jessup. Here. Mr. Simmons. Here. Okay. Next on the agenda is the uh, minutes. Is there anyone who has any thing they want to mention about the minutes? Anybody want to put a I move to approve the minutes of November 19th, 2019. Seconds? Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Abstain? Passed. They're good minutes. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Agenda analysis. Anybody wish to do anything to the agenda? Not hearing anything. Citizen comment. No citizens in the audience that are not meant to be here. <laughs> uh, new business discussion. Uh, Holcomb Boulevard. I believe we have some people here who are going to report on what they've uh, noticed about speeds and such on Holcomb Boulevard. And I'll please take over, state who you are and what you represent so everybody knows that the blue uniforms actually are ours. ours. Good evening. Uh, captain Sean Davis, I'm uh, the operations captain here at Oregon City Police Department and I brought along uh, Sergeant Justin Young. He's our traffic sergeant. So I was gonna talk about a little bit about Holcomb Boulevard. I know we've had some uh, complaints about speed and talk about reducing the, the speed limit. We've been in meeting with the neighborhood association up there um, and hearing their concerns. So it's been talked about that when uh, Public Works maybe puts out their trailer when we put out our trailer uh, people see that trailer and either they they slow down or they do sometimes speed up um, so we have a covert speed measuring box that uh, does all the speeds and counts the vehicles and stuff so uh, working with Public Works we decided to put that up there and see what the different results were so you have uh, the results uh, that were presented um, the first one we put out was on Lower Holcomb Boulevard uh, between Swan and Hunter, and that was for the week of December 19th through December 26th. As you can see, it picked up uh, speeds of 35,000, almost 400 cars. Uh, those cars were picked up speeds going both ways. Um, for that area, the minimum speed that we saw was 10 miles an hour with an average speed of 70, 37 miles an hour and the 85th percentile was 43 miles an hour. Uh, that Holcomb there is a 40 mile an hour zone. Uh, we did see a few people that I would say were pretty egregious, um, one at 72 miles an hour. Um, so we've we had our community service officer analyze the data so our uh, traffic team can be more efficient up there rather than just being random patrols. Um, and we found out that Overall, there's approximately 1.17% of the vehicles doing 50 or over, um, with the majority of them about 1% between 50 and 54. So we can figure out the times based on the data that we pull, and uh, we realize that between 1 and 3 p.m., specifically 2 p.m., is the highest we see the highest violators for speed. Um, so they're spending some time up there and focusing in that area at that time. Um, we also then put the box the next week from December 27th to uh, January 3rd on the upper part of Holcomb near Winston. Um, this was, we saw 24,000 vehicles. Um, we saw more speeding up here, which is, uh, it gets more towards the county. Uh, so I don't know why people are speeding up there, but uh, we found out that there's two time frames, 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. are the biggest uh, when people speed the most and approximately 2.6% are 50 or over. A, but, a question? Yeah. Who was, were you able to determine direction? I was just gonna ask that. This doesn't do directions. Okay, so, um, thank you. But we did see more. There's a little bit more people. The 85th percentile up there is uh, 44 miles an hour um, with the average miles an hour of 36.85. So of the speeding vehicles, we're only seeing about 2.6% that are 50 or over. So we've been able to spend some time up there, our traffic team, um, and focusing on the 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. And they've got some uh, 
been very successful at that. Uh, and then the lastly, we've had uh, up in the Barlow Trail, na- Barlow Trail neighborhood, we've had a lot of complaints with the new houses up there and speeding vehicles. Uh, so we just put that up January 8th through the 15th. Um, and we've seen, <clears throat> we saw 3,600 vehicles. And again, that's both ways coming and going. And it was up off Barlow. The average speed up there was only 19 miles an hour uh, with an 85th percentile of 24 miles an hour. So um, the highest speeder was 35. So 10 over will look very fast in the neighborhood. Um, but overall, the vehicles were going within this lower than the speed limit of 25. Was this where we were putting the speed hump? Is that where we put this? Okay. I think it's close. I don't know. Do you know. I don't know where Public Works put that up. So we have to... The box we use hangs from like a light pole and it's about 40 pounds. So they put it up there, but it was in about the same area where they were putting up the radar trailer. And so when they would take this down, they would then go put up the radar trailer. And so I've been working with Jason Thornburg, but I don't, he's not here tonight, but I don't know what his results are to see if there's uh, a difference, but their trailer only measures one way. And so their vehicle, the amount of vehicles they're going to see is different. But the work is still, so these are specific results to the locations that we wanted to measure speed. Correct. Uh, the question about whether or not uh, the data we get through the radar signs where it tells you your speed, mm-hmm. we've yet to correlate the two as far as, as far as we can report tonight anyway. Jason may have done some work on that, but the, that's still forthcoming because we're curious, you know, do people really slow down for that or speed up or I think maybe a little both but yeah i think some people want to see how fast they can get that registered too but overall i think most people will slow down when they see it so it's a good deterrent this they have no idea it's even out there so it's measuring vehicles at their normal driving behavior okay and then justin uh, sergeant justin young's been up there and he's in charge of the traffic team if you have questions about the traffic enforcement but uh it's one of a regular rotation that we do to monitor speed Kind of eye-opening. I, I live up there, and yeah. uh, people have been complaining to us for years and years about speeders on Holcomb Boulevard, yet these reports so far show that they're very, very the average is very, very close to the speed limit. Yeah, and I think anyone that lives in a neighborhood, if they see a car go by that's, you know, five, ten miles an hour over the speed limit, it looks fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And... There are some cars that are doing that, and that's where we're focusing on. But the majority of the cars are driving well within the speed limit. Would it be fair to say you prob- one probably remembers the outs, the the one that attracted your attention more than the ones that you didn't see that I'm you sorry, didn't what's notice? That? What's that? Would it be fair to say that that you remember more the ones that were? Say, shall we say ripping versus sure. the ones that are just oh absolutely i mean i live in a neighborhood and when a car goes by fast i'm like wow that car is mm-hmm. definitely going over the speed limit but then if you take it back and see the majority of the cars are really really going the speed limit so it's for this device it's very good for us because we can break it down have it analyzed and our analysts can show us exactly the time period that we should be up there to be the most effective and have the best outcome so that's what we're doing right now cool. I think the other thing is noise. I don't know if you noticed, but a lot of the uh, younger generation likes these muffled yeah. vehicles, and they sound really loud, but they really don't move like they sound. It, it's not just the younger ones. I live on I live on Fifth Street, and some of the younger ones you're talking about have gray hair. <laughs> is that right? Yes. All, it's multi generational now. <laughs> but it's uh, one of our traffic officers, John Fetzer. I don't know if you met him, but he's up there quite a bit and he was doing it before this was out just to kind of see where the speeds were and he wasn't he said the lower side there wasn't many speeders he would occasionally get some that were faster than you know the 40 miles an hour um but he said when people are going up that hill of holcomb trying to get up um past swan they're accelerating to maintain that speed so it does sound fast although they really weren't going fast um but again we do have an occasional person that's speeding about one percent to two percent of the vehicles are speeding i would say pretty egregious you know if you're going 10 plus over i mean that's it could be pretty serious i mean stopping distance increases and your perception next week or next month uh park place has a 
neighborhood meeting, general meeting, and I'll take this information to all the people and let them know what you found. John, if you find out any more about that other study, you were oh yeah, would okay, you pass it to me as quick as you get it so that I can take it to the meeting also. Okay. okay. And when I was in high school, I had the loudest V8 pipes in the city of Portland. <laughs> well, I was proud of it. Were those the cherry bombs without no, the No, these course? were, I had a 1950 Oldsmobile with the uh, uh, headers coming off of both sides right into two burned out glass packs. I knew they were burned out because I burned them out myself. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was easy. You, you burned them out the first time you used them. No, I just poured oil on them. <laughs> Do we anyway, know moving on. Plans for the pumpers. Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Question. Anderson. So you said that your analysis was allowed you to figure out what was the most opportune time to be there. Yes. So how does that stand up over time within the department in terms of is it something that gets regularly scheduled, whether it's once a month or once a week? Or, and how do we know when that stops if, or if you have an intent to stop that? I'll, I'll feel that. Um, so like uh, Captain Davis had said earlier, uh, we, we were doing much more sporadic, much less focused, very random patrols for speed monitoring and enforcement up there. Um, what this data does is it allows us to be a little bit more surgical, a little bit more deliberate. Mm -hmm. um, and with, with the concerns up on Holcomb, as well as, and in addition to concerns within other neighborhood areas within the city, um, we, we, we were able to have more <clears throat> um, of a, kind of a focused enforcement approach. Off the top of my head, I think we've been up there about 12 times for different missions at different times. Um, and, and like Captain Davis had said, uh, the amount of really egregious violators is none. It was none during our hours. And so uh, that we were able to see. It may be happening during those hours, the days that we're not there. Um, but nonetheless, do we have a, a regular Tuesday at nine in the morning that we're going to be at the upper area? No, we don't. Um, and, and maybe through some of this data and when the stuff is compared to, um, with public works, it, it definitely might be able to tell us, hey, they're headed out toward the county or they're coming down the hill. Um, but but once, once we're able to get this data and really continue to, to um, focus it, uh, we're just going to continue going up there in the hours that this is saying our right. biggest violators are at. Okay. Perfect. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And then I did have one question in relation to this, and was that as the plans moving forward for the neighborhood association on what, on that speed hump? Yeah, so okay. um, Brian Sergi, Sergi um, one of the residents from Barlow uh, who attended our uh, attack meeting, he's been communicating with Jason Thornburg okay. a fair amount. So I think they were, uh, last I read, going out. <clears throat> They're getting some more quotes for the work. Um, but yes, that is still moving forward. Okay. Uh, as you might imagine, with paving work like that, they need a whole lot better weather. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, time will tell when they get it in. Um, I will make sure I get with Jason uh, in the next stack meeting, and we'll be able to give you guys hopefully a, a better update on is do they have it actually scheduled? Do they have a contractor picked out? <clears throat> things of that nature. <clears throat> Jason did tell uh, that, that group of residents, when they do get a contractor, before they pull the trigger, we're going to have a, a little pre-construction meeting mm -hmm. um, just to make sure that contractor's on board with <clears throat> our specifications. And so, you know, hopefully we get a little better feeling um, that that contractor will be able to uh, actually produce that speed hump and make it within the parameters that we set. Specifications. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions or anything? Any more information that we need to have? Well, thank you very much. It Absolutely. was very informative. Thank you. Thanks. And we thank hope you on behalf of the neighborhood for, for your work up there. <laughs> and, uh, we'll have someone up there to talk to the neighborhood association. I'm you, ready to. You guys are next Monday, the 27th, is your meeting? I think, I'm not sure the exact date is. I think it's the third Monday. That was yeah. That yeah was, this this was fourth Monday, January only, and then third Monday for all the other months. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, we're gonna have somebody there. Oh, man. Cool. Great. All right. Thank, Thank you very much. Forward to seeing you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, next is the 
Beaver Creek Road concept bike inter interstruction interstructure plan. Infrastructure. Is it possible? To, is it possible to make that a little easier to say? <laughs> I need the clicker. Stuff about roads and <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Okay, we'll let this warm up. Oh, there he is. Okay. Finally. Y'all know Christina. Mm -hmm. I don't see anything, but do you see anything on your screen? We've got it on ours. Okay. It will pop on. It'll there pop we go. Up. There we go. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Christina Robertson Gardner. I'm a senior planner with Oregon City, and I'm working with our planning commission and community residents to implement the zoning for the Beaver Creek Road concept plan. So I've got a seven slide uh, presentation this evening and kind of give you an update of where we are related to bike infrastructure, and we're looking for some general comments. So the Beaver Creek Road concept plan is one of three concept plans that was adopted in 2008 and readopted in 2016, though really in a sense most of it was written in 2006. So we get to talking about um, the infrastructure design, it really to kind of time travel back to 2006. Uh, what you see um, up to the top of the right is the initial uh, kind of out outlay that looked at the different zoning areas, uh, basically industrial to the north of Loader Road and a mix of commercial and residential to the south of Loader Road. It's generally the golf course and the um, airline strip, the airstrip that's east of the Oregon City High School and college. So the sample adopted street section for collector roads have a bike lane and the way the adopted plan uh, showed general right away but did not identify specific widths of any subsection. So we kind of dusted off the adopted plan and looked at the right of way they identify and all the things they want in the right of way and then realized that most likely they were identifying a five foot bike lane in 2006. These are for collectors. A local street wouldn't have a separated bike lane. It would be just a, a, a shared street like we have for our local streets. So this really discussion this evening is for collector and above conversations. So why are we here tonight? Um, the Planning Commission, as we move forward um, with our package of recommended code amendments, identified um, a wish to see enhanced bike facilities in the concept plan more than what was adopted in 2006. So we've had some internal discussions with staff. Um, we understand we do need a need for uh, wider bike facilities. You know, the uh, best practices today are different than what the best practices were in 2006. But we also need a little bit of a balance of flexibility and certainty for the final design. We don't need to pick the final bike design tonight or through the spring. But the way land use works is when an application comes in, we can require dedication for streets. But we need to legally be able to acquire that right away. So if we have the wrong right away number, in the plan, we can't get the full right away we need. So that's kind of what we're looking right in the concept plan is we want to make sure we have the right numbers in the adopted code that, that should be adopted this spring. So the plan calls for, and I'll go back here, a kind of a green street median, uh, which we still think is really important to the kind of vision of the plan that had both aesthetic green and functional green streets. Uh, not necessarily the landscape meaning would be the functional part, most likely that would be on the outside, but kind of the aesthetic part of green streets. But with um, need for a wider bike lanes, we may need some additional right away. So going back, we understand we could just take the median out of the middle of the street and we would have the right of way we need to expand, but we think that by doing that ne doesn't necessarily meet the spirit of the planned streets as they were adopted. So we may need to require additional right of ways, kind of where we're at at this point. <coughs> Protected bike lanes uh, is one approach and that is where you have um, basically 
vertical separation or at least separation between the bike lane and the, 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 the moving car lane. And that can be done in many different ways. So here are some examples you see on the, the slide. It could be um, vertical elements like the popsicle sticks. It could be um, the cars itself of where they're parked. They'll sometimes if you switch and have the bike lane on the inside and the, and the cars on the outside, that car itself creates that protected bike lane. You could have change of materials. So there's many different ways to create a protected bike lane. And internally, the Public Works Department hasn't quite you know, uh, determined what the optimal design would be. But we, once again, we need to make an uh, understanding what the uh, maximum right-of-way dedication we would need. So there's some examples. Uh, if you have an eight-foot bike lane, uh, which is kind of the way of doing the protected bike lane, you would have, you see the bike lane, the five foot um, bike lane, and then a three foot buffer area with some type of separated element. The one to your left shows the parking on the outside. The version on the right is kind of more the traditional option, which is the parking on the inside, but you have to add an extra one and a half foot uh, door buffer. So really you end up with a nine and a half foot bike lane if you uh, kind of keep it on the outside of the, par of the uh, parking area. So once again, we're not necessarily recommending one or the other, just more this is what an enhanced bike facility looks like. So where are we today? Um, we're coming to you this evening to kind of hear your comments, recommendations, fatal flaws to our approach. The Planning Commission will be looking at their full code amendment package, all the work we've been doing this fall and winter at the February 10th, uh, 2020 Planning Commission meeting. Um, they're going to kind of do their initial recommendation and we might have a meeting or two to kind of uh, finish up their package. Uh, we will probably send a small survey out to about the 200 people on the Project eBlast and our social media channels about the issue we're talking about this evening. And then the City Commission is going to be doing a work session for the whole Code Amendment pa package, not just this element. Uh, right now it's scheduled for the March City Commission work session. So we want to make sure this evening uh, to hear from the Transportation Advisory Committee, any recommendations you have, and just know that we're kind of trying to find that balance of certainty so we can get the right of way acquired, but we still know we have some work to do as we move forward to the designing of the collector level roads. I have a question. Sure. If you'd go back to sure. the cross section. That, this one? Mm -hmm. Yes. You're showing a seven and a half foot planting strip on the, uh, on the parking aisle, if you mm -hmm. will. Is there any consideration given to reducing that number? We could, but the seven and a half foot is a recommend, recommended planter strip for collectors, just citywide for collectors. Mm -hmm. So we've been kind of looking at if we're going to be building this to a kind of a city collector standard, that's where we're starting. So there's, you know, if the the question of do we reduce the medium or remove the medium or reduce the planner strip, then we're kind of leaving what the adopted plan was. So that's why we're reaching out to the community to see, you know, if, if you keep within the right of way, you're losing elements that were adopted or part of our uh, corridor uh, of right of way. Are there any plans that have said whether there's safety considerations with one versus the other? No, so in 2006, all that was said is we need bike lanes. And generally when you look, so I'll go back, when you look at, 90 inches. and this is one of the streets, but when you look at it, um, it, if you start adding up what those all are, you pretty, pretty soon realize they meant five foot, foot. bike lanes. Okay which has no protected area, either mm -hmm. as just added buffer or um, where you place the, the bike. So if we go back to the next one. Sure. Uh, the cross section. So on the one on the right, the cars would have to cross the bike lane. Yeah, it's... it's so is that a safe... Has there been any tests in other areas where they say, okay, in this particular yeah. situation, we've had more incursions by cars hitting bikes versus the one on the left where you've given them clear separation? So I'm not a transportation engineer, but I mean, okay. for the most part, I know Ray can probably chime in. I mean, 
protected bike lanes, the one on the left is, is usually more recommended. Mm -hmm. um, and I can go back to the, these are all protected bike lanes examples where you have that vertical element and that space. Um, so those are generally more recommended than the non-protective. But for communities that don't necessarily want to have the parking on the outside of the bike lane, that's the recommended width to still allow a safe, enough safe spacing. And could you also extrapolate the fact that if it's less area required, the city's gonna have to acquire less right away, which then overall would reduce cost? Is that a safe assumption? Is the width, is the overall width, I'm not adding up all these numbers. Right, and I'm just giving you a subsection okay. of the street line. It was just, Rather than to, to concentrate our conversation, yeah, and a wider street potentially be more expensive. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> if you're only able to have bike lanes on one side of the road, does that one bike lane, is it any wider? Yeah, if it was a bi-directional bike lane, it would, yeah. it would be probably even wider than the nine and a half feet. Okay, and then... Um, were these considerations included in the park place and the south end concept plans? That's a good question. I can take a look. Most likely, if a plan was adopted in the mid-2000s, it would have the five-foot bike lanes. Mm -hmm. So we're now kind of reassessing. Um, and that really was for this particular piece because we're in, in the Beaver Creek Road concept plan analysis. And the code amendments will just be for Beaver Creek Road concept plan area because that's how it was noticed. We wanted to make sure um, the project wasn't suddenly making citywide changes. So if something comes out of the Beaver Creek Road concept plan that wants to be more citywide, that can be a discussion after the, the whatever is decided for Beaver Creek. Then could you go back to the diagram of the concept plan? Sure. Can you give us any idea of how many collector streets? Well, right now, and that's a good question because we we have a lot of collector streets in the Beaver Creek Road area. Uh, generally, a lot of the roads you see a kind of um, uh, back identify kind of could see like a white and a gray. Um, the way the concept plan was adopted, it showed the major roads, knowing that inside there'll be an additional grid with local streets. And so uh, one thing we have been hearing from some potential developers of, in the areas, we think you might have too many collectors, yeah. but I think what we're saying is um, it really takes a transportation analysis to determine if your transportation um, numbers would would meet the level of traffic to be. So if for some reason there were some areas where that level of traffic was much less, that it would transition to a local street. And is your consideration for collector streets any difference between an industrial area and a residential area? Uh, the the area north, we are looking at potentially there'll be wider uh, traffic lanes and wider turn lanes, correct. But a lot of the kind of outside will most likely be the same, but the areas related to um, truck transportation and freight uh, will be the appropriate lane widths and turn widths for um, an industrial area. Yeah. So Thank you. Um, I imagine Beaver Creek is probably itself an arterial? Correct. So this is so kind of not just Beaver Creek, this is everything inside, not Beaver Creek Road itself, because we went through a separate process with the city commission on that. Okay, are there bike lanes on that on a arterial? Correct. Right now there's eight foot bike lanes right now with no on-street parking. Okay, yeah. Thank you. I'm wondering uh, if there's any um, evaluation for protected intersections as part of this, or is it only protected bike lanes? Well, that's right. The only thing that related to the concept plan that we want to change. Um, so the concept plan doesn't give that level of detail. So um, one thing that was identified is there may be some additional, you know, citywide intersection discussion, but because it wasn't specifically detailed in the concept plan, we want to make sure that um, uh, we're not uh, continuing to implement something that doesn't meet today's best practices, but if we want to have, we're not quite ready to add new new information to the adopted plan, if that makes okay. sense. Yeah. The reason but, why I'm asking that is because, uh, especially if we look at a two-way uh, um, bike lane, then you have to look at signals to make mm -hmm. sure if somebody's going, 
if it's a one one way street, then you gotta have other way to have a signal for bikes. Mm -hmm. um, and also, potential intersections usually are safer for, for bikes, especially with right hook situations and motorists who don't really realize there's cyclists around. So I'm a fan of protected intersections. Mm -hmm. yeah. They are more expensive though, I'll say that much. <laughs> Has, is there any difference between residential and industrial areas as far as the number of bike lanes request? I mean, either planned or... Well, all collectors right now have bike lanes in the plan. Okay. And so if the reason you would not, the two areas where you would not have bike lanes would be the two blocks of the main street, which is right down at the intersection, it's the red dot at the intersection of Glen Oak Road. And that is really a very small um, neighbor, neighborhood main street where you're imagining kind of 15 foot five sidewalks and imagine kind of two blocks of downtown um, where there may be, you were kind of in a Shero situation or a local street. Um, since there's plan to be transit in this area, possibly, with the uh, shuttle or other transit options, are you looking at any uh, transit facilities as part of this uh, plan, like for people who are at a sidewalk trying to cross the bike lane and the uh, parking uh, we would to get over to transit? Sure. We would rely on citywide standards for transit. So this is what we're, we're looking for for Beaver Creek is what's specific about Beaver Creek that's okay. different from a city standard. And as we implement it, do we have the right number? Okay. To me, this, uh, well, for one, uh, we're the idea of, yeah, get right there, perfect. The idea for this was to get, uh, we've got a concept plan that we're trying to adopt really zoning for. Mm -hmm. Out of that has triggered a lot of questions about transportation, which makes sense. Um, noticing in this case here, so there was a whole conversation about Beaver Creek Road. That's a, kind of a different conversation, but I think we got to a good place there. <laughs> now there's this question about, was the original plan um, really uh, have enough forethought to think about bicycle infrastructure um, in today's standards, right? Mm -hmm. Since we're kind of taking a new look at this. And so we kind of felt like it didn't. And I think the concern is that, you know, making adjustments, what can we, what can we absorb within the existing right of way ask, which was kind of approved back in 2008. We may be able to fit these extra things in there, but usually there's compromises associated with that or we may have to ask for more. And so uh, I think part of the, so we like to bring those conversations to the Transportation Advisory Committee anyway, but there's also kind of a time issue here that I just wanna point out because I think that's important too, which is the issue came up at a planning commission meeting and a concern by the planning commissioners and uh, the planning department is trying to be responsive to that. So they put a lot of work into trying to really figure out whether or not you can squeeze these in there and uh, and then try and have some public involvement process that um, meets a reasonable threshold so that it seems like a small adjustment to me and it also seems like one of those questions that, you know, feels a, a, a little bit uh, like a no-brainer in the sense that, well, who, who wouldn't want better biking facilities. But, um, I, you know, I think it's worthwhile for you to consider. And um, I don't, you're not asking necessarily for anything, but I mean, it would be good to hear if you uh, had concerns. Um, you know, same thing with, to me, there's something to be said for some of the pedestrian ways as well. You know, is there opportunity for more? Uh, we talked a little bit about the strip park through there and the fact that one of those collectors has parkland adjacent to it. So is there an opportunity to maybe blend the, the pedestrian, pedestrian way and bike facilities with, you know, something that feels a little bit more like a parkway? But all those things, again, it's really about making sure we're getting the right of way right because we've got lots of latitude once we have that right of way ask. Unless we're, you know, asking for, you know, golden brick, Pavers, and then the development community is probably going to be okay with whatever you know, whatever uh, as as long as we're not asking them for more right away than what's in the plan. So, well, I, I will offer my two cents worth based upon what I've done here in past years, 
and what I know about how the uh, these plans were done then, and it was done mostly by outside uh, consultants, and frankly, bike lanes were not very highly thought of at the time, and there was not the thought processes done in the, in the industry mm -hmm. that are available now. And you're dealing with something that's 13 years old as adopted and more like 15 years old as thought out. Mm -hmm. And given that, yes, a protected bike lane is way more desirable. I know I used to ride enough to know that I don't like riding next to the to the cars, no matter how fast they're going or slow. But it also strikes me that the seven and a half foot planting strip is rather generous for anybody to want to maintain as an adjacent property owner and that you would probably have a better chance of staying with keeping your right of way width and reducing the planter strip width to say five feet which is still a generous uh, planter strip and using that extra foot and a half in the bike lane because um, frankly <clears throat> that seven and a half foot looks more like a weed patch to be than it, something that's going to be attractive. You know, I tend to agree with you on that. I hadn't thought about it, but I used to have a home with a strip like that. And it was about five feet wide, I think. And maybe the standards say seven and a half feet. Whoever standards that are, that is, but who's to say we have to follow the standards exactly? I think Henry's got a good point as uh, five feet would give you plenty of planting strip and a little more for the the rest of the bikes and the buffers and parking and all that. But I've got another question here. I've just noticed that there's, in these two diagrams, there's a difference. One has a foot and a half buffer and one has a three foot Mm -hmm. Looks like buffer. It's called traffic or something. Why the difference? Right when you are when you're having the car as a buffer, um, and you're against the um, curb, that three and a half buffer um, is also the door area. Oh. But when you are on the outside, you still need the door area. Basically, you need to be protected from the cars and the bikes yeah. when you are when you're at the nine and a half foot, okay. and then when the eight foot. You, you're, you basically, you're using the curb. You don't need the, the extra foot and a half because the door zone is also the protection zone. Yeah, okay. But anyway, getting back to Henry's statement, let's, uh, let's maybe think that maybe we're smarter than the standards once in a while. You know, we don't always have to follow the standards. So I'm, what I'm hearing, let me know if I'm putting words in your mouth, is you are supportive of, you know, pursuing the, you know, best practices, bike facilities for 2020, but really looking at our existing right away and see how that can be fit in. I think that would be a fair statement. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. agree. Yeah. I have a question. So have you guys looked at, at the bike lanes that are grade separated or, I mean, just taking the bike lanes out of that street section altogether and putting it next to a sidewalk or yeah I mean that's another option I think it's more of that sometimes it's still it's still giving you grade separated or adding it to a pedestrian bikeway potentially is more right away well no I mean if you took that five 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 foot bike lane and I mean you have three foot I mean that's not nine, nine and a half feet there and you have five foot sidewalk I mean if you create a 12 foot sidewalk and a bike lane combined that's less than 
what you have on that on that section. And I think like being out there behind the planter is much safer than being next to a car either way. And unless you happen to step in front of a moving bicycle. Well, I know, but that doesn't, I mean, you see it, I mean, you, even there you could, I seen okay. where they separated the odd. So you're saying create more of a boardwalk kind of area <laughs> yeah. with yeah. a designated biking area? Well, there's, um, the state parks has several mixed use pedestrian uh, walking paths and bike paths and they're roughly 10 feet wide and frankly they're almost dangerous to walk on because of the way bicyclists bike you know they'll use the whole the whole width available to them and it's and they're moving twice or three times faster than the, the people who are walking. So there's, well, know, you still have a differential in speed. And Ray can always jump in and defend himself. <laughs> well, I think the answer, though, is yes, we have been talking about the combined shared use paths. Mm -hmm. And we've looked at several scenarios for that. What we're really kind of saying is this provides for this. This section here doesn't show that. But this provides the space that if in uh, further design and analysis and layout of the development uh, plays out in a way that we decide, well, we really want more of a shared use kind of off the street section, we, we could fit that in here. And the area that we've where we've shown that doesn't show up here, but it shows up on the, uh, what's the name of the street that we're calling for? Uh, twist, uh, yeah, so this. This will... What's, what's the name of the street there? Thimble Creek. Thimble Creek, yeah. <laughs> uh, so kind of the parallel road to Beaver Creek Road, and I know you can't see my um, laser pointer, but mm -hmm. the this is really the parallel road. Mm -hmm. Some people called it Holly Lane Extension, which we find super confusing. <laughs> so we would like to refer it more towards, towards the word term Thimble Creek Parkway or Thimble Creek Boulevard, and it would really be um, the Holly Lane extension that gets you that's south of Maple Lane that runs parallel to uh, Beaver Creek Road. And that area, a section of it, does have a very linear park, and we have a, a kind of a pearl and string approach, and the string of the pearls will be a shared use path okay. uh, with some landscaping. And we're, But that's only on the east side of the area related to the park, which is kind of, if you look at the green triangle, kind of everything south along the green triangle, you'll see this kind of green L. Mm -hmm. That kind of shows that the area for the pearl and string where we could have a shared use path option. And that would be where, yeah, exactly, you'd have a, a curb and the, the bike and the peds would be on that shared use path. But not every collector uh, makes sense to have a shared use path. And the other thing that um, I didn't talk about um, as part of the code amendments, the Planning Commission really wants to pursue uh, 20, 20 mile an hour on local streets in the Beaver Creek area as a test case. Uh, this supposed to be a really pedestrian friendly, bicycle friendly area. And because no one lives here yet, it's a good mm -hmm. test case for the 20 mile per hour area. And so with that, we have opportunities for really kind of low volume streets and potentially even some family friendly streets if we want. Uh, within that, you don't see that next step of the, the local street grid, um, which will come and play out at a subdivision application. I personally like Thimble Creek Terrace. Okay. <laughs> I'll go on record and say I think it ought to be Holly Lane. <laughs> well, I think you may lose on that one. <laughs> uh, I want to go back to the um, planner sure. strip question because I'm the one who's been advocating for the wider planner strips. And um, I feel uh, so. Um, our standard is four and a half foot, right? Is this is seven and a half in collector. In uh, is the standard? Mm-hmm. City standard for a uh, seven foot planter strip. Seven and a half foot planter strip for collector streets. Oh, I guess I I was thinking of so I must be thinking of residential then mm -hmm. at the four and a half foot. Mm -hmm. I like it because those trees, so often we hear so much frustration about trees. Mm -hmm. um, it pushes that tree, the, the, 
the, the stock of the tree away from the curb. And so, you know, we're not ending up with these trees that are already in, you know, the minute they're planted, they're already encroaching into the, in this case, the bike lane. They'd be further set from there. And then they just have that much more potential to thrive and become, um, you know, in my mind, a better tree. And so that's where I like the wider planter strips myself. So now, is there a, another planter strip running right down the middle of the street as well? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I assume that's going to be city maintained. Mm -hmm. but, and these outer ones will be businesses or residential right. in front? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what Bob was talking about, yeah. there's going to be a yeah. disconnect between I, I how they look. The other piece that we've been working on our stormwater master plan for so long, you know, the the street trees do play an important role in stormwater. You know, mm -hmm. they create shade, they create yeah. uh, ability to reduce the temperature of the water that hits. So it's it's all kind of like a lot of things, everything's integrated and mm -hmm. you push something and you get something else gets pushed this way. So, um, you know, wider planterships do play a good role in our stormwater management plan as well. Is, is there still a, a recommended street tree list mm -hmm. versus width of planter yeah we have it on our planning division page and it's based on three and a half five i think of seven and a ten because my my suspicion is is that you could probably address a, a portion of john's concern by specifying a smaller size tree would have to be installed if the planter strip mm -hmm. was restricted in. Yeah, all trees need to meet, either need to meet it beyond our planter list based on the width or have an arborist provide documentation that it, because we can never keep up with every cultivar and we plant trees in Oregon. So we basically say, here's our list or, you know, an arborist has to verify the right, that it's the right tree. Isn't it also feasible to have a tree that goes, has deep roots instead of roots to go out? It's not required, but we always do recommend root guards um, as a way to channel roots down and not horizontal. I think maple trees are not are are kind of forbidden. Oh. I know kind of where I just I just know that sometimes roots cause disruption on the sidewalk. So, what uh, what do the bikers prefer for these two diagrams? Look, I prefer one on the left because. It, the car is parked there, provides the sound barrier, and also if uh, you don't have to feel the car next to you. Um, but then for the motorist perspective, that they have to cross the bike lane, and if they're not used to looking for bikes, because, oh, I mean, unless you're in, I mean, Portland people look for bikers, but out here, they might be used to it, so they may get freaked out if they see a cyclist, they don't look before you cross and could happen to hit each other. So that's my concern is if they're not, you know, where you're used to looking for cyclists that could cause a collision, accidental collision until they used to the cultural change. Um, but I definitely prefer to live on the left because it uh, feels safer. I sort of prefer it too, mostly because the farther away I am from a truck moving at 30 miles an hour, the less side blast I'm gonna get when I'm on the bike and also, if I can get a five-foot bike lane with a three-foot buffer next to the car, I'm probably minimize. There's probably a minimum chance of collecting a car door accidentally while I'm on the bike, because most car doors will will end up inside that three-foot buffer mm -hmm. when they're open. Most, yeah. I think a Camaro will probably go <laughs> another four and a half feet. But <laughs> I also like to add that uh, storm grates. I don't know if you've looked at the design of that, um, but the reason why I asked that or mentioned that is because a lot of times they have uh, wide spacing on the grates, and my wheels get caught in it. So I don't know if there's a city standard for. It is. Uh, yeah, we are bike friendly. Thank you. <laughs> My bike goes appreciate it. <laughs> I think curb inlets are actually better, but that's beside the point. I agree with you on that too, Henry. What's better? Curb inlets. Instead of having a grate in the street, yeah. you have an opening in the curb. Okay. And the water comes oh, around yeah, and drops yeah, into the yeah. curb. Oh, yeah. I hear you say now. Yeah. Into the, 
Yeah, they're easier to clean, too. All right. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, kind of quick, quick question. So, I mean, we've had a lengthy discussion here. Is there any elements of this that we want to put in a motion so it goes forward so people can see? Is there anything what specifically happened? planning was looking for us to add function to? Well, we had we had this discussion um, earlier in the week or last week um, about what we're really asking you folks for, and and uh, really we. I think maybe generally would be that the tax supports the idea of buffered bike lanes in the Beaver Creek concept area. Would that be sufficient for you, Christine, you think? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I, even the recommendation that, you know, uh, I mean, we, the planning commission, they're balancing, you know, lots of things regarding to the right of way, but. Um, you know. We would be happy to make a recommendation if you want one. I would just like to I don't think revise it a little buffer. bit because there's a difference between buffered bike lane and protected bike lanes. Mm -hmm. Buffered is usually just paint, mm -hmm. and protected usually has either a concrete raised protection or car uh, lane protection, and it's a lot safer to have actual protection versus mm -hmm. just paint. So if I like to, you know, revise that to say protected bike lane, not yeah. just buffered. I mean, you can say like when, when, you know, when. Perfected bike lane preferred if, if possible. I, I'm, I'm okay with that. The The concern that I have is there's there's several different street sections we've already, we've talked about internally, including the residential street, which would be more of a, a Shero kind of a mm -hmm. <clears throat> typical residential street. So I just want to be careful when we make, if we make, yeah. if you make a motion. We want to make it specific make, to collector. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe. Yeah, and, and, be, and before we make a motion, I would like to point out too, if you have a protection that is a, a vertical solid protection between your street section and the bike lane, you're going to have a maintenance problem because you're not going to be able to <laughs> see yeah, through. Do you guys prefer the bike lanes? 90 inches. 90 inches is how narrow our streets we can go. Yes, and that's, that's just the dimension of the sleeper. That's, seven feet. Right? that's, that's not even, that's only yeah. seven feet, seven, seven and a half feet. Seven and a half feet. Yeah, and, and, yeah. So they won't fit it by clean then? No. no. Okay. So how do we buy specialized equipment? So three bars in Portland? Portland's doing it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, I, 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 we struggle with that too. For one, we're still kind of conceptually going through this. It's just trying to stay on track with a planning commission meeting mm -hmm. for approval and moving that forward mm -hmm. I think we've still got some but I, I just um, so My, to me it sounds like the, what we are hearing from you in the discussion is support for better bike infrastructure that would include buffered and pr protected bike lanes and mm -hmm. I, I don't think we need a motion for that and, and, um, certainly and the other part of it was I think was if possible, staying within the right way. It's going to be a challenge. Yeah, I mean, there may be times where we just can't. We need yeah. to add the extra two feet, but there may be times that we're balancing well, and we can. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. I would hate to. I would hate to tie it down to the point where yeah. there was. But in general, it looks like yeah. you should be able to provide it and stay within the right of way. Right. And then, you know, the planning commission will give us a direction. And then, just so you know, the the, the product will be a probably a one page exhibit A that'll be added to the plan that further refines where there's you know not quite yep. um, perfect correlation to the plan in today's best practices and standards. Out of curiosity, from the survey aspect, um, how is I don't know if you've thought about how you're going to be dispersing you know, the language going to be used in that because uh, the reason why I ask is because. Portland cyclists and people usually are used to this kind of infrastructure, but I hear it's new to them and they probably don't think like I do with the issues or pros and cons. Mm -hmm. So are you just going to like say this is a cross section which we like best or are you going to like explain details about it? Yeah, I, I don't know yet. Okay. Um, something I'll be working on this week. I think at a minimum we have to let the community know that this is happening because it's just the basic public outreach requirements. I mean, we need to bring everyone into the table that's interested in this conversation. Uh, it probably might be qualitative comment. We're, we're not going to be asking people to pick your favorite A or B because that's not where we are in this process yeah. yet. We're still, you know, balancing. Um, so it may just, 
be more, here's what we're thinking, are we on the right track, is there a thing you want to share, it may be that level of, of survey, because we don't want to be in a place where we're preliminary picking a design that we're not ready yet, because we don't have the details. So I think that's the way that at least the roundabout and the uh, three-lane versus five-lane cross-section from Beaver Creek Road was done, was a lot more detail on what the pros and cons were, and that's the reason why I'm trying to mm. get in the forefront of this case. Uh, I just want to make sure it's worded in a way that when the survey results come out, that it uh, they know what they're voting on, basically. Yeah, that's a good to bring yeah. in conversations about maintenance and protection. Yeah, I like exactly. that. Cool. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Well, thank I you, think gentlemen. It was I really very, appreciate very your time. Uh, next. Next is the uh, public works report, I believe. So I couldn't remember. Um, I don't recall out of our Malala presentations what we shared with you last, but um, I wanted to make sure we were covering some public testimony that came up. And so I may, if I've repeated this, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the project as a whole, just to remind you all. I want to talk a little bit about um, what's coming in terms of construction schedule. But also, if, if you remember in 2019, was, we had some folks that were concerned about the dual lefts off mm -hmm. of Malala yeah. Avenue out of Beaver Creek. And uh, there was a concern about some uh, pedestrian conflicts with some right turns at that same intersection. And I, I couldn't tell if we brought this back, so. Um, I don't remember it. I, we discussed it, but there was never never brought back. Okay, so good. Yeah, we'll cover that tonight. Um, I'm still gonna try and cover it pretty quickly. So, uh, thank you for your time. Um, so, we've, we have heard a few commu uh, uh, key community concerns, uh, definitely, public outreach has been a challenge on this. We've done a lot of public outreach on this, but we haven't necessarily heard directly from the tenants, which you would think you would hear a lot from the tenants because we're gonna have some pretty major impacts. I think uh, what we have done, we've since heard from them that they're really excited about the project and they're looking forward to it. They just want us to do it. So um, uh, we talked about this southbound right turn lane at Beaver Creek Road. That showed up kind of late in the design. It wasn't our original intent to take the that project, move that part of the project forward at all. But we've since added that. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about pedestrian crossings and uh, concerns about the traffic at the post office and what we might be able to do with that and a couple other things that I'll cover. So um, with regard to the web page, uh, by the way, uh, Dana Webb, who's our city engineer, she presented this to you last time. Mm -hmm. she, uh, she's been the project manager. We've uh, since hired a guy named um, Brian Van Smorenberg, who's a senior project engineer, who's trying to transition from design phase into the construction phase. So he's taking over for Dana. But Dana and our uh, administrative staff have done a really good job creating this public involvement webpage. So um, if there's ever a question about it, it's just looking at this, it's pretty well updated. It's got a lot of information about various meetings that we've been to. And uh, maybe if I'd have looked at this, I could have told you whether or not we'd already talked about this, but it looks like TAC <laughs> was done back in October of 2015. So that kind of information is, is available. Uh, online as well as the open houses and then any support documents that you might be interested in or that the community might be interested in you can always refer them to that but we've got lots of things there's been some follow-up questions in fact the questions that came up at our uh i know they were in the september the september meeting was where um there was a mike ard uh, from our engineering mm -hmm. came, William Gifford came, and mm -hmm. they spoke. That was in September. And so, as subsequent to that, there has been some uh, traffic um, analysis and uh, issue paper that followed up with that that's online as well. So, should be able to get everything that you need to from those documents. Um, so really, uh, this southbound right turn lane at Beaver Creek Road, we heard the concern for this movement right here in that um, with you know the project being a success, lots more pedestrian traffic, lots more calls for pedestrians at that signal. What we're proposing is converting one, one of the through lanes, 
the what's really the the middle lane uh, to a left turn lane, which means that outside lane or the lane closest to the bank, they're highlighted in red, is uh, the through lane and the right turn lane, right? And so we asked Kittleson and Associates to do a fair amount of analysis of that to see, well, what happens with uh, twice as much pedestrian traffic as we have today, what would that do? And the result was, uh, yes, there's potential for some delay, but not so much delay that it warrants a turn lane there. Um, so this project does not include a turn lane. Uh, what we have acknowledged that there's, there's likely with the build out of the Red Soils campus for the county, there's gonna be more times that we should look at this intersection and it may at some someday in the future warrant a right turn lane there, but we're not seeing that in today's analysis. Here's the configuration that we're proposing, which is the dual left turn lanes from Malala Avenue southbound to Beaver Creek Road east southeast bound. And um, so we definitely are still advocating for that, mostly because we think we need it, one, during construction, and two, after construction, we have seen um, enough evidence that there's a lot of through traffic and we're seeing a lot of the left turns that are in the single lane left turn that back up. And they back up even with the uh, permissive uh, flashing yellow signal that you get at that intersection. Now with this configuration, you won't get that flashing signal, which is uh, makes it a little less efficient for moving traffic, but we've had a lot of accidents in that intersection too. And we think that it's just busy enough that, uh, well, for one, it doesn't work very well with the two lane. In fact, I don't even know that, I don't even think they allow it with the dual lefts, but um, it, that, that, element of the pro, that element of that intersection would go away. So no more flashing yellow for that movement. John, um, I still have a bit of a concern on that right-hand lane being both the right turn lane and the through lane. And with pedestrian <coughs> coming across parallel with Beaver Creek Road, I mean parallel with Malala, takes quite a bit of time for a pedestrian to come across from say that that uh, assisted living facility over to, to the bank. Mm -hmm. And so you've got people lined up <coughs> wanting to turn right and also wanting to go through all on one lane. By the time the pedestrians get across there, it doesn't seem to me like it would leave much time to get that all those cars through there because whenever I'm on that intersection it seems like there's a lot of cars that are wanting to turn right at that intersection uh, well in addition to the ones going through so I I don't know I've just got to express my concern of that particular issue it <laughs> might be a backup there I am but I, you know, you're listening to the experts, so yeah. what, who am I to say? <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's something we, we, we uh, our, our analysis, and I say ours, the, the experts, Kittleson Associates analysis, there is some delay there, but it's not, uh, doesn't, it's not sig significant enough to, um, to warrant the addition of a right turn lane. It, is it going, would it be backing up enough to start blocking the exit out uh, there by the bank and by the um, uh, McDonald's? Well, that's why Mike Gard was here. I mean, he was, he was representing um, the shopping center property owner as well. And uh, I think that there's potential for that. Now, there's a lot of access points to oh, that property. Yes, there is. So, uh, you know, I, I don't, uh, from our perspective, it's not, um, you know, a, a fatal concern, but there may be times when, yeah, it backs up past that driveway. I'm, I'm thinking about the possibility of sometime in the future being able to move some of those movements over to the, the signalized intersection out of the prop, Danielson's property there so that some of these can be um, closed off or otherwise utilized that perhaps 
is part of what we're doing here, it may be advisable to start having some sort of, of redesign back in their stuff so that there's less less demand to go out through there. I don't like think there's the, a lot now. Coming but, out of those would be uh, no yeah. right turn. Yeah, yeah, no lefts or whatever, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think what we're saying is um, let's continue to keep an eye on it. We're not proposing to change driveways in and out no. of that shopping center property. I don't think um, so. I no. do think that they have an abundant amount of uh, access mm -hmm. along that frontage in particular. Um, you know, as we see further development of the site across the street, you know, where will pedestrian traffic really be headed? Will it all be headed on that one side? Who knows? There's no. a lot of questions mm -hmm. about that. And yes, we want pedestrian traffic to be, would like to see more pedestrian traffic. When will that develop? When will that generate? We don't know, but um, we're just, we're, we're making very clear in this project scope that yes, we're going to incorporate the dual lefts. They can be done with striping and some mm -hmm. s movement of signal heads only. Mm -hmm. Um, adding a, a right turn lane would require that there's a signal pole on that corner as well. It would have to move, so it'd be it'd be pretty much a redo of the signalization in Beaver Creek Road and Malal Avenue. So it we're trying to avoid that. So we're pick, we're t we're picking some pretty low hanging fruit in this case, and uh, uh, with the understanding that we need to keep an eye on that. And you probably have to get some right of way where it looks like there yeah, might not definitely. be enough be a lot to get. It's another right away file, which mm -hmm. we're trying to minimize those. Remember, this was an this was about an eight million dollar project. We're seeing that number change, um, not just because of this is small mm -hmm. right here, but we've got some other project things that are. Anyway, this is kind of a, a picture that uh, we have. We have a camera now on uh, power toot power toot power tilt a zone camera uh, a zoom that can pan tilt zoom, zoom pan tilt zoom <laughs> thank you that uh, is mounted on that signal head there so we can we can look in either direction now and zoom quite a ways but this is just a picture that was taken about 3 30 p.m. So it's our PM peak it's that really beautiful. kind of stacks up. <laughs> there I are. <laughs> so we're hoping that that through lane uh, isn't too big of a problem. But, um, you know, in this case here, a lot of those cars are using the middle through lane right now. And in the future, they'll have mm -hmm. to make that left turn. So you don't, it's, I mean, I could see the, I guess maybe not, you have dual lanes. Uh, you may, it seems like more people want to go left than wanting to go through mm -hmm. in the background where you circled with it. Yeah, it looks like they're all where that red is. They're all backed yeah. up waiting mm -hmm. to queue into this lane versus if you moved all these behind the white minivan, there's not that many trying to go through. I think the, you know, the hard part is, is we tend to design these things for peak hour, right? And there's all those other hours of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, I still, you know, still think that the through traffic is going to be uh, reduced greatly. And after, you know, enduring probably years worth of construction on this project, I think a lot of people will find that route to be better. Um, keep in mind, we also, I think we've shared with you that we got the million dollar arts grant from the state for signal upgrades along Beaver Creek Road from really Maple Lane all the way to Warner Parrot, Warner Milne. Sorry. So we're going to see signal interconnects, new controllers, safer signal heads. You know, that there's just a lot of improvements along that corridor as well. So um, by the time we're done with Malala, we'll also, I think the timing is such that we see improvements on Beaver Creek Road as well. Signal improvements on Beaver Creek Road, <laughs> let's, let me clarify. So real quick, uh, not much change here. This is uh, we're still planning on a pedestrian crossing. This is right in front of Black Rock and the apartments. So um, again, seeing lots of jaywalking at that location anyway. So this should be uh, an improvement, but it will prohibit uh, left turns in and out of the driveway um, there. 
but there's lots of access points to this facility as well. So we think that, um, you know, it'll be a change for people like myself who use that driveway all the time. Um, and I'm sure many of you do, but just finding a different way to get into that parking lot. There's lots of options. Then the other one that was has been somewhat controversial and we've tried to make some adjustments is the uh, crossing near the post office and near the fire station. There's been, we've tried to look at every option available. Neighborhood wanted it back down at near Garden Meadow. Couldn't put it there. We're pretty concerned about the fire district, some of their access points, talking to the post office. They prefer to be between the two driveways as opposed to um, kind of closer to the fire district. So I think we've got a good compromise here. Um, so that's where that's at. I, I, I got a, a thought about that one. Having used the drop box a lot and making that right turn coming out of the, from the drop boxes, I am finding myself thinking that there's quite a few new people, probably myself included, who will be looking left for a hole in the traffic and then turning right into the possibility of getting into a pedestrian by the time I've turned my head around to look ahead. So, and one of the things that comes to mind is that there's been a number of pedestrian type accidents of that nature on one way streets where you are looking one way and turning the other and there's a pedestrian in front of you that you didn't see because you weren't looking. And I'm thinking where possibility exists that we're setting up the same situation here. Well, the only thing, I, I mean, yeah, right turns, uh, if people aren't looking, there, there there's potential mm -hmm. for uh, always a problem mm -hmm. there. But the one thing that I would say, but by the way, the, by the flashing beacon symbols, they in this graphic, they didn't actually move them into the right location. So that they're, they're <laughs> okay. still sitting where the old locations were. So that pedestrian beacon would be between the driveway and the pedestrian crossing there. So between, uh, I'm gonna point with this pointer. So okay. it would be right in this area. Okay. So, and the other thing that's great about those rapid flashing beacons is they don't, they all, they have the flashing beacons on the front of them. Mm -hmm. uh, there's usually a, 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 a beacon strobe. on the side, a strobe. Or a strobe on the side of them as well, which would be uh, pretty obvious for somebody in that, mm -hmm. in that driveway. So maybe that's a good thought. Uh, Henry is how do you uh, for both of those how do you put those flashing beacons in a place that's close enough to alert both the driver coming uh, north or south on Malala but also focused on the the, the driver that's in the driveway so yep. I think maybe that's something well that's a good thought well the other driveway too uh, the same thing would apply if somebody's coming out of the other driveway attempting to turn yeah, coming left right out of onto Malala, you could face the same situation oh, where, you're, where you're looking off to your right for traffic coming to you. You're not looking left where the crosswalk would be. It, you mean the, the same situation? You mean the biscuits right out of biscuits or left yeah. out of the Just, main post Are you office. talking the biscuits driveway? Uh, no, out of the out of the. Uh, out of the post office driveway and the other it, driveway. Well, you should be looking, you should be seeing those pedestrian rapid flashing beacons uh, mm -hmm. if you're okay. if if you're coming out of that driveway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so they would be, you have plenty of sight from both sides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With, with, with this one, the first thing you're going to, your first lane you got to cross is the one coming from your left. Yeah. So, right. everybody looking so you're all looking at this stuff already. Then you get out to no, here. here. If you're, if yeah. you're looking to your right over here to yeah. turn left yeah but if but 
Yeah. You better be looking left because you're going to be crossing that left that yeah. through yeah. lane. And, and so you've got to be looking both directions if you're <laughs> And when you're in the, the median, you're going to be watching your your right hand mirror, so you're kind of looking forward. Well, I'm going to get a Hummer, and everybody just better look at it. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like an excellent idea, actually. I'm just writing a note because um, I want to make sure I don't forget that. Um, no, we've got him all discombobulated. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's a good suggestion. So, um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, here's another one uh, that's down near the point. Um, okay. OC point. I think and you got the same problem there, too. I think the uh, not as. Maybe I'm looking at it wrong. The, the median, so the driveway, the driveway on the down on the side that's on the downside of the slide mm -hmm. is, is there's a median there, so they can't turn left. Exactly. Um, and across the street, coming out of the little shopping mall there, I can't remember where that yeah. driveway is. So that that's quite a distance from yeah, there. So I don't think we have that yeah. problem there. I remember. Yeah. We've made quite a bit of adjustment mm -hmm. there, and we've worked with, working with SureGuard as well. That's just where <clears throat> we're, we've spotted the uh, cross street banner, so that um, there is a grant project that Dana applied for and got for the uh, cross street banner. So um, Vance's crew would be able to safely install a banner from one side of the street and have it pulled across the other so we're working with a uh, manufacturer on that and uh, but anyway that's that was a concern for that is location. it something that you just roll like ours is a little more uh, our our design concept and what we've used in the past is a little better and that it's got a cable system where you can move that cable from from either side of the street you can move it from the pole location oh, okay connect onto the banner and somebody can feed it across and you oh, can okay. pull it across and don't have to be out in traffic think, stopping traffic think like a bolt crank with the cable sending it across yeah uh i think we shared you, with you this the um yeah. feedback we got we had i think we had sheet metal like what we've seen in some of our other places and people like the uh, basalt seawall option better, as did the property owner that kind of fronts this. I wanted, to, before we move on from this, I just wanted to give kudos to the, the cyclists that you guys chose. I don't know who chose it, but having a female with uh, normal clothes on, book bag, and uh, standard bike not drop down to is that's city biking looking. So I appreciate the look of that bike. Oh, wow. Well, I'll have to tell the artist that. <laughs> and the reflectors on the spokes. <laughs> yeah, so I like this, this cyclist. It's nice. Yeah, it's not usually done that way. I can't tell if the dog is lifting its leg on anything. Or not. <laughs> 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 All right, so real life is what you're saying there. We got some real life stuff coming. <clears throat> All right, um, good. So um, construction is coming. Uh, I know we've been talking about this project for a long time. It feels like a long time getting here, and we've had a lot of um, good community support. I just want, I did want to re-acknowledge William. He mentioned this at the last one, but he did have a lot to do with the, the fact that the city got the grant. At, at that time, we were um, trying to get public feedback. Sometimes it's hard to get public feedback. I think the tax supported this as well, but you know, William showed up. I know, I can't remember if any of, any of the tech members showed up, but the, but you know, we were competing for that funding with several other cities and, and county agencies. And uh, so he mentioned that a little bit in his last uh, comment that we heard from him. And uh, I just I just wanted to kind of reemphasize that that, that that kind of community support has been really good around this project. So appreciate that. Um, but traffic impacts, obviously, once we get under construction, we're going to take that, which which is really pretty much a three lane section and it's gonna to turn to a two lane section and we're gonna push it one on one side or the other depending on where we're working. Um, so there won't be a turn lane. Bikes, unfortunately, we're gonna suggest that you use Beaver Creek Road or Myers, which is off the beaten path of ways. Um, at Claremont and Gaffney and really, you know, there's a couple other side streets there too uh, that, would, that, are, that are already um, 
stop controlled, but right now Claremont and Gaffney are signalized, and once we get into those, uh, to the degree we can no longer use those signals, we're going to convert those to a stop controlled, so it'll be stop sign. That will be different and might be a little frustrating. We'll just have to monitor that and see how that kind of works out to get people off those side streets. But. You're speaking about both Malala and the cross street being being stop signs. Yep. yep. And due to the new state law, cyclists can treat that as yield sign then. Okay. Well, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. But then there's no track around. Yeah. I just want to make that comment. I would stop. I would, um, um, I'll probably stop. Pedestrians have right away too, right? But we like to tell them to um, pedestrians have priority over before cyclists. they step out, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so anyway, the, there's going to be like some the significant yeah. traffic impacts. We expect night work. Obviously, you know we've got one lane through, but there'll be times when trucks will be pulling out and need, you know, to actually even slow that one lane traffic to uh, allow for a construction activity. So keep that in mind. We'll probably close. Uh, Claremont while we're working on Claremont and push everybody to Gaffney and vice versa when we're in those intersections. So uh, it's going to be tough. I, success, I encourage you to use Beaver Creek Road. But we also know that there's a lot of businesses that you can't get to from Beaver Creek Road that are on Malala Avenue. So um, if you want to go to Burgerville for, you know, shakes and what kind of fries do they have? Um, they got all kinds of fries over there. Then please go visit Priggerville or <laughs> any 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 other business that's along the corridor. So when is groundbreaking? Well, we haven't bid the project yet, so we don't know. But we're, sh we're shooting for um, soon. <laughs> How's that? There <laughs> there is some tree removals that we expect even yet this month. We're um, we had we had requested bids for tree removals um, to get that work started first and uh, we ended up working out a deal with PGE so PGE is going to remove the trees our trees and their own trees PGE has several trees so quite a few trees I think they're close to 40 trees that are going to have to come out of various sizes in, along the entire corridor but PGE has trees PGE, in their easements PGE is um, Ask, we've asked PG to move outside the right of way into the public PUE, which is outside the sidewalk. So right now, if you've walked that corridor, a lot of the power poles are right in the middle of the sidewalk. So moving them out and onto private property and in doing that, there's not only PGE lines there, there's all the comms. Mm -hmm. And so all the communication lines, which hang much lower, are in conflict with a lot of the, a lot of the trees, some of them large. So expect that. Um, Transportation projects are hard on trees. <laughs> we learned that with Myers Road. I don't know if you've been through Willamette Drive lately. Has anybody driven down went through West Lynn? And yeah, Drive? I was there the day before they did it, and then I came back a couple days later, and I was like, "Where did all the trees go?" Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. And all that, all that, so they can change the parking. Well, well they're no, taking off that. More than that they're, yeah. they're doing a lot with. They're doing a um, mm -hmm. cycle track, mm -hmm. and uh, they're doing. Yeah, better pedestrian access and on-street parking. So it's it's not just so they can reconfigure the parking. <laughs> They're doing a lot of things. I've heard I've heard street trees with uh, with electric uh, electric for lighting and yeah, some pretty neat stuff. So that, that'll be that'll be a good project to watch. Mm -hmm. um, Artificial dug for think that used to be a so out to bid in March. We hope to start construction in late spring, yeah. early That's summer of 2020. So it's gonna be done in a year or so. We no no uh, well um, we're they're gonna be able to do a lot of the work throughout the winter, but it kind of depends on the winter. And a lot of the work that comes last on that project are the things like corn out the street. I think I mentioned before, um, it's not just new sidewalks and new signals and those kind of things. The street section of Malala Avenue is, uh, you know, it's an old state highway and it's held up pretty well for as long as it's been there. But um, this project will rebuild that. And by rebuild that, I think it's about a 24 inch road section that includes, mm -hmm. I don't 
don't remember the numbers, but I want to say like nine inches of asphalt over, uh, I don't know, 16 inches of rock. So it's a pretty big <laughs> section. And uh, so, yeah, <clears throat> you know, how much of that work happens in mm -hmm. weather like this is yeah. dependent. And then paving is most likely going to have to be maybe <laughs> late spring, early summer. So well, this well, is, I'll tell you, though, that's really outstanding forethought. You know, as far as I'm concerned, that's really great. You mean the on the section that they're that they're going that deep to rebuild Malala? I mean that's yeah really thinking far ahead rather than just <laughs> little thin patchwork stuff. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, what we've done on, on on all the sections of Malala Avenue that have been rebuilt, Beaver Creek Road to similar section. Um, it's just with bus traffic and truck traffic, bigs are, the rigs are getting bigger and bigger. So yeah, it's it's, it's mostly due to truck loading that, that drives those kinds of uh, road sections. But um, it's very expensive. I guess that's the other little message is, um, you know, we're, we added, you know, all that, all that work kind of outside the project area for the dual lefts. That's not very expensive because it's mostly striping mm -hmm. but the signal changes that we're doing there and then um the new signal at fur that's that wasn't intended in the project and then yeah just the cost of construction uh have changed significantly so we're we're a couple million off so we're working on filling that gap as well so one thing i will say is we um have been able to justify a lot of the pavement maintenance dollars for this project because of all that roadway construction that we're doing. Um, next year, we're not planning to do much, if any at all, um, reconstruction work. We're still gonna do things like slurry seals, but um, we won't be doing a lot of milling and paving, except for what Vance's crew can do with the milling and paving. So, got a, got a little, that's how we're gonna cover the gap. Okay, if you don't have any questions, I'll move on to the next topic. And I think, let's see, what the agenda here? 99E bike and pedestrian improvements. I um, don't have a lot other than um, we got a nice grant from Metro on, um, uh, or we got notice, so far we haven't seen the grant, but we've got notice that we're, we're going to get the grant for $673,000 to look at, this is the wrong slide, but um, slide. that's for the next yeah. presentation. Right now I'm talking about the 99E bike and pedestrian improvement projects uh, and pro project, which is in your binder. There's some project information sheets, but it's basically looking at um, feasibility of increased pedestrian Oh, that's driving, that's, that's no, distracting me. <laughs> I'm looking at that and talking about something else. Thank you. Yeah, that's way better. Um, so, uh, so anyway, trying to get pedestrian traffic from really 10th and Main uh, over to the Willamette Falls Legacy Project. So there's a, we were talking about this on 99E, mm -hmm. further out uh, on the other side of the tunnel, how narrow that is, but it's also pretty narrow along that stretch of 99E as well. The reason why it's narrow is because most of it's on a bridge, so it's most most of that's elevated, mm -hmm. and it's an ODOT bridge. And um, once 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 it's no longer a bridge, then we've got that kind of that parking area where the fishermen always used to hang out along the waterfront there. And so, and then you get a little further, and you've got really the full bridge abutment there, which is another constraint. And then once you get beyond that, then it's back to, it's a nice wide section because of that parking area there, but trying to figure out how to um, facilitate bikes and pedestrians to be able to maneuver that section of uh, 99E is what this study funding is for. So it's a grant really to just um, look at project development for that, try to figure <laughs> out ways to either cantilever or build a new bridge or, look at something grade separated that gets a lot closer to the river, um, there's probably gonna be lots of options. So that uh, is what that grant is for. And other than that, sh um, sh I'm gonna read her email because I think it's easier than trying to John? express. 
am I remembering correctly, or did, isn't though aren't those viaducts on the state's list of of degraded bridges that need some attention? That's true, but it's also not uh, there. It's not a facility that ODOT foresees any time in their immediate or immediate. far future. Yeah, is the cantilevered section fifty years from now? Yeah. yeah. Is the cantilevered section that parking under the bridge, or does it actually also include the roadway? Is that the, like the, by actually the, the area under the bridge isn't cantilevered. Yeah. It's, okay. it's sitting on bedrock, and you can see, you know, as you as you look off the edge there. But just south see. of it is. Uh, right. Yeah, uh, north, just, just north, north of that. Yeah. So between really the McMinimums and, and the bridge. McMinim, minimums and the, it's, I, I think it's, well, you can on Eighth Street. There's a little trail where you can actually walk mm -hmm. under it, but sh okay. but it's sh not much further from Eighth Street, and it it becomes solid ground again. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It, behind behind bridge. the courthouse, it's a full bridge. Yeah. So this is a study. Let me let me let me read it just because uh, um, there's there's good information in the packet for you, but uh, for the listening audience, I'll read this for you. So on January 16th, 2020, Metro Council awarded Oregon City a $673,000 grant to assist the city in project development of the Willamette Falls Shared Use Path and Oregon 99E Corridor Enhancement Project. The project is located on 99E, or more commonly referred to as McLaughlin Boulevard, which is an Oregon Department of Transportation facility. The corridor is identified as a regional bikeway and pedestrian parkway, and a frequent transit service run parallel to the corridor. The remaining phase of the McLaughlin Boulevard enhancement plan has been the most complicated to complete. It is interwoven with the Oregon 99E viaduct, that's the bridge I was talking about, and a uh, lack of proper lighting, crumbling sidewalks, uh, not wide enough to provide barrier from adjacent fast moving traffic and uh, dilapidated railings makes transit users and pedestrians feel unsafe. Project has two main goals that address barriers to investing and revitalizing properties that front McLaughlin Boulevard in Oregon City. First one is close the gap and provide safe pedestrian and bicycle access. Provide a complete street design for McLaughlin Boulevard from 10th Street to 99E Tunnel. In 2005, the McLaughlin Boulevard Enhancement Plan, which completed the phasing, planning phase and alternatives uh, identification and evaluation was adopted. Since then, we've completed phase one and phase two of the key corridor. Plan assumed the viaducts or the viaduct would be replaced in the near future, allowing the identified crossing sections to be implemented. However, the viaducts are not expected to be replaced with a widened structure that would support the widening, widened sidewalk. So we need to update the options with this section of the corridor to provide needed bicycle and pedestrian access. This grant funding will allow the city to complete the alternatives, uh, identification and evaluation to determine how we address this critical gap in our active transportation network. Once preferred alternative, alternative is identified, we would continue forward with preliminary design to 30%. The city looks forward to getting this important work underway in the coming years. The grant funding is for 2022 through 2024. So we have a better idea on timing and project details. We will reach out with additional information. So if you're not familiar uh, with phase one and phase two, phase one was the area with the deck we're uh, really between 10th and say Sportcraft, that whole area, that was phase one. Phase two was a section uh, that's real, really around Dunes Drive and between Clackamas Bridge and McDonald's, okay. uh, that area. So that's good news. Any questions that we can I have one. along to Dana? <laughs> I'm curious how the uh, downtown businesses have thought of this because if, you know, pedestrian and bike traffic uh, move over to the, to the uh, 99E instead of downtown. What they, you know, that would impact their businesses possibly. So I'm curious what their thoughts are if they happen to lose bike pet traffic from downtown and move over to 99E if it becomes more attractive. Um, yes and no. I, I don't know how much outreach we've done to, for DOCA, which is the Downtown Oregon City Business Association. Do that's not DOCA. Mm -hmm. um, 
but there's been a lot of regional discussion about this gap and how bicyclists, for instance, can get really through Oregon City to Canby. So this is one element to that, along with the Willamette Falls waterfront mm -hmm. path. And you know, those of you that know much about that, it also extends through Kanema along the railroad grade there. So the idea would be to stitch that together a little bit more for um, bicyclists and pedestrians. So um, there is, uh, um, th th there's still that, um, you know, active n need for folks to get into Main Street. Main Street isn't that friendly either for bicyclists. It's friendly for those that are competitive maybe and more yeah. willing yeah. to, you know, endure traffic, but families aren't using it. So, yeah. um, and, and there's really no option to make that core, that Main Street quarter any more family friendly than it already mm -hmm. is. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, what about the, the tunnel? I mean, that becomes obstacle, but you're saying the traffic would be routed through the... Yeah, the long range place. plan is to take this waterfront path that, you know, I mean, imagine, so uh, another piece of information that I wasn't planning to share, but Gladstone got uh, included. So there's, there's a pretty big funding measure that Metro is considering right now, which is called the T2020 measure, mm -hmm. which will be on the ballot in November. But in that, they're listing a lot of projects just so that um, they can touch on all the communities with good projects and hopefully get their votes. Um, and one of the projects is to get the Portland Avenue bridge across from Gladstone to Oregon City, which would you know, bring that whole bike path system that goes really all the way into Selwood straight to the Cove area, through the Cove area, through the Cove area, uh, take it around through Clackamas Park, on through John Storm, over the McLaughlin Phase One projects, and then, in theory, this Phase Three project, and that puts you onto the the Blue Heron site, where there would be a waterfront trail along there, and the long the long range plan is to have um, some conversion of some of the railroad grade along uh, the waterfront between the falls and Kanema convert that to bike pedestrian friendly as well. So you'd miss the tunnel altogether. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a lot of projects, yeah. a lot of challenges. Um, so just piece by piece by piece, it, it you know, it's kind of So is together. this phase three trying to get from then phase one, phase two goes north. So yeah. phase, phase one, one south to the Will Willamette Falls like Blue Heron project. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Not, not to mention the double track high speed rail that's supposed to go through that same <laughs> corridor. <laughs> okay, so back. Sorry. Can, can you oh, you back okay. uh, now I can be distracted with. <laughs> so I, 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 um, I don't quite remember how this topic came up. Maybe one of you can remember how this topic came up. But the idea of a three way stop at Gaffney Lane and Berta. Mm. Um, I, I, our, I, our member that isn't here brought it up at one of our previous meetings. Vance Tonga. Oh, brought Vance it. brought it up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, so um, I knew that we knew the topic had come up. We just couldn't. I couldn't remember how it came up. So anyway, that I just want to give you a little update. We've talked about this internally. We haven't really made a full decision, but I felt like it had been out there for a while. So I was just gonna. Um, mention a couple things and um, Kim can you hand these out so one thing I just thought we'd do is take an opportunity to remind you we have um, on our website this um, and we put it at various counters around but this stop sign brochure which kind of <coughs> provides a little bit of information about warrants for stop signs because we get requests for stop signs pretty regularly and so this document has been around for a long time. Uh, hopefully our numbers are still good on it, but uh, Just get, uh, uh, we've got Warner Milne on our, on our address here, so we probably do need to update that. But do you also get a request for yield signs or just stop signs? Stop signs. Okay. Stop signs. Uh, and in this case, that was the request was to, right now, um, Gaffney Lane has really only got one stop, and if that's, that's pretty much if you're headed westbound on Gaffney Lane. 
And um, so we had Jason uh, Thornburg look at this and Dana looked at it. Um, Jason was looking at it more from, I think, you know, just how do you post the signs and, you know, he, you know, what's the configuration there? Is there, would he not support it or would he support it? And then Dana looked at it more from the warrant perspective. Um, and her position was, doesn't meet warrants, shouldn't do it. And uh, that's, um, that's one way we could go with this. I think um, Vance brought the idea of a temporary uh, change associated with the Malala Avenue project, because like I said, there's gonna be times when we're gonna close Claremont, we're gonna push all that traffic over to Gap and um, it is a little bit of a confusing intersection. It's odd <laughs> in the alignment. Uh, there's curves and sidewalks on one side, but not on the other. And so I just thought we'd talk through it a little bit. Um, this is approaching it from Berta. So I don't know that these are necessarily in great order, but this is the Berta leg. Mm -hmm. And right now you can go through there without any stopping. You can go through and make a left without any stopping. You know, the only stopping vehicle is, is the vehicle that's in the Gaffney Lane leg that's mm -hmm. kind of on the left there. So that's a little closer look. Um, the, the one, there is one little complication with that in that the driveway that's over here on the right hand side of your screen is right kind of where we put, put a stop stops. bar and a stop sign. So trying to figure that out was Jason's concern, I think, was just acknowledging that. Um, this is the other side of Gaffney Lane and obviously the roadway does a little kind of a twist there. So if you're going through it, you still kind of have to make a little bit of a veer to, to stay, out, uh, stay away from the oncoming traffic. Um, so the stop bar there would look a little odd as well and just trying to make sure, uh, you know, the stop sign is visible um, is, is a concern. Um, the, the, the other thing we could do rather than put stop signs is just right now we don't have the, um, you know, cross traffic does not stop sign at rider. I, I can't remember if that's what it says just, or not, but just something read my to that mind. effect. Um, what's that? You just read my mind. Yeah, um, so we could we could do that um, as a as an option and not do the stop signs on the side streets. Uh, I, I'm I'm having a little trouble um, deciding, but I do think the fact that we're going to be moving some traffic that doesn't normally use that to that intersection might I, make sense on a temporary basis. I, See I, I have a thought. Have it, using this a lot. That's my alternative to get to Fred Meyer because uh -huh. I don't like going up Malala. Um, my thought would be to make Bird a, a yield and put a bump out where, well, well roughly where the, the um, garbage cans are, and then put your signage in that bump out, maybe th three feet or something, just just enough to get it past the sidewalk area, but out where you can see it. So, like right here? Yeah, right, a little bump out right there with the signs in it. And make it a yield, make that leg a yield. For, we don't have a lot of yield controlled intersections. What, I know. What, what, what would that? Well, what's going, what seems to be happening is. Why would you, why would you yield if, I mean, that guy had, because the, that traffic has a stop. You have, in this scenario, you have a right away, right? Okay. You could just we, go do whatever. You have a conflict because, as from my experience, the majority of the people currently using Berta are also making a left onto Gaffney. And the people coming around the corner from Gaffney from way back by the school this little short section of Gaffney is not uh, enough to be able to allow the driver approaching you to both anticipate your turn and set up for the corner without stopping. So do we have 
traffic increase well, that would be like such a, that has well, stirred this, or what's the concern? So, um, left turn yield to oncoming traffic, or something? Well, yeah, some, some, some of that ilk, because almost all of the traffic here, to my knowledge, which is limited, is heading toward Fred Meyer, coming up Burden and going toward Fred Meyer. Very little of it seems to be going up Gaffney because that takes you back to where you were. Yeah, I, I just feel a little concerned about using the yield with a stop sign. Um, yep, the stop I, sign's over yonder. But I mean, in the same intersection. Yeah, but the yield is for the oncoming traffic coming towards you. So I would yeah, have to yeah. say yield to oncoming traffic. Because right? yeah, because this guy's coming towards you is doing about twenty five mile an hour plus or minus. You're doing about five as you make that corner. I mean, to me, this if if the alignment weren't screwy here, it'd yeah. be no, it'd be no different than street. Street. Yeah. yeah, it'd be no different than just because the lane left, changes. You have to yield. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 So it seems yeah. a little. Would it would it help just to add like take that little jog out and literally stripe it like it continued on Berta? Like stripe it like this is one st the picture we're looking at. If you yeah, strike it so it's like one street, because then it's like any other intersection. I think part of the problem you've got going on here is you've got it striped with that little turn to the right saying, hey, this road goes really to the right, as opposed to if this was just one straight street striped all the way down the middle, you'd treat it like any other right turn. Yeah. So uh, I I was using this for my, I was taking my uh, kids to us. Uh, Soccer games there at Gaffney and mm -hmm. practice, and I and I would come off Malala. I never understood why it felt like the Malala that Malala is the main, the street that should just continue to go. There shouldn't even be a stop there. You mean the Gaffney? Street. Yeah, Gaffney. Yeah, and the stop should be actually on Burton. On yeah. Burton. So John, can you go okay. back? There's a slide where we're looking the other way there. Yeah, it is weird. Forward. So you're saying just move the stop sign over exactly. here, yeah. and then yep. that one. Come. actually 180. Yeah. What so I'm, 180. To what I'm saying is make it everything go to the right. Yeah, yeah, if the majority of our traffic is on Gaffney both ways, okay, because of the flow of the road, and I just, I must admit, I just sort of thought of this as we're going through these slides. I think what you're mentioning is uh, keep Gaffney both directions, you know uninhibited with a stop sign and put a stop sign at Berta. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, e even the lay of the road. Yeah. Um, and certainly the stripe helps this, but the way that road was constructed, it looks like Gaffney was there and then at some point <laughs> Berta got added on to it. Are you saying to put the stop sign where the trash can is? Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and remove the stop yeah. sign on Gaffney right there. And yeah. take this to, to allow both lanes on Gaffney just to proceed through mm -hmm. so the people on Berta then would have to stop. Instead of your striping going up to the stop sign, make it bend around and connect yeah, 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 over here. Yeah, so right. yeah, just either make it go straight through as one street or make it go around the corner yeah. as one street. Mm -hmm. Right now it's if you, neither. If you get a stop sign here, and I know we're going deeper into this. So <laughs> I know where you're going, but I think on, when you're coming from the other direction, what you could have, a, and that's up on the Hulk, and actually on, on a, um, Malala. No, there's a, a foresight road as you go up. There's mm -hmm. a street where you could put a, a right turn permitted. So you could have a stop. Right turn is permitted. You could just go through. You don't. But if you want a straight, you would have to stop mm -hmm. and continue. So you could fix that. Yeah. yeah. I think it feels like the the Gaffney needs to be. A, I mean, and I mean that you drive it from the other side. It's a, it's a. I mean, you should treat it as a, as that, and that would facilitate traffic. Once Thanks. you close out, I mean, people will just be oh. channel, channeled, and they'll just drive that way. And, and Gaffney is one of the designated uh, old, uh, main roads. Does yeah, it's more of a collector. Than it's a collector, I think. I think it's a is collector. it Berta or Bertha? Berta. Berta. And does it really get any much traffic on it between it's the lightest leg? But we uh, we do have traffic numbers. Um, I don't remember what those were. It does feel though that Berta Gaff gets, Gaffney should Berta be gets the, the lightest. Yeah, that'll be truly the true road, like Vance said it. 
just you get the feel of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I yeah, move the stop sign over, connect, yeah. connect the center line, make, take the stop away, and make it just one fluid movement. And you obviously need to put some. I'll make that motion. Well, if you're yeah. if you're making that curvature, maybe the sign the stop sign could move a little bit. You know. Well, my main point was to let you know that we have. <laughs> 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 I don't need a motion because we don't know, and that's not how we design intersections. Uh, but uh, I wanted you to know that you had asked, somebody had asked from this committee. I couldn't remember who, and we heard that. We're still kind of working through it, but I wanted to give you an update, and I just. I think we have some opportunity with the Malala project to maybe try something out, whether it's stop here, remove the stop, or whatever we do. We're not putting a signal in or a roundabout. How's that? <laughs> I go back to my point. That I didn't. I don't know if it answered or not. Do we have issues at this intersection with traffic and crashes not, and not? Uh, we don't have a, a much of an accident history here. Okay. That was the other. So this so, this, this doesn't really meet great in theory, but maybe it doesn't solve anything <laughs> for a stop sign at all. But, um, but what, well, sometimes I, I, we get into those because they're just unique and and depending on the familiarity that the community has, you know. I mean, it's definitely driver aware, right? Drivers without that again in your stop sign brochure. It'll tell you that um, if you approach as a driver an, an uncontrolled intersection, it's driver aware, right? You may have to yield or let, you know, or, or not to an intersection. In this case here, though, it's a little bit, it look, feels a little bit more like a through streets, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you, in this case, there is no stop there. You can go any direction you want and not stop. Why was why was the stop placed there in the first place? Um, I think because of an, a community concern, and there is a lot more traffic coming off that Gaffney Lane. Mm -hmm. Like I think it, it's close to meeting warrants, so the westbound's close to two thousand trips a day. But if I mean, why wouldn't you that have on the other? I think there's a street over there too. Yeah, I think it's just the use. And I, I don't know. I don't know the history of that stop sign. It, it, it's probably about 65 years old. Nobody's ever questioned it. <laughs> yeah. Except Vance Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Really. John probably didn't know about this. <laughs> shall, we, shall, shall we move on? Yes. <laughs> I, I'm anxious to get this done by 8 o'clock. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. Communications, anybody have any communications for back. us? Was there, Ray, was there, were you going to uh, ask for it in this one or in future agendas for the uh, House Bill one? I was going to, do you have a video to show about the House Bill, uh, or Senate Bill uh, 998? Yes. yes, that's the video. Give it a shot. So to explain what the uh, new is there a sound? Yeah, there's supposed to be sound. sound. That's so. the problem. Don't have sound. I can just screen watch it as well. Pretty visual. Oh, it plays through on. this. It doesn't play through the screen up there. Yeah, uh, I, they might be able to hear. I can. Can you hear this? I can hear it. Yeah. About as much as it takes power this to the output of a typical car engine, which generates something like a thousand light bulbs worth of power. A bicycle can be a practical alternative to an automobile. A bicycle's efficiency is almost entirely dependent on its momentum. A moving bicycle is operating at peak efficiency. Even as it slows, it remains efficient. saps the riders available energy so bike riders do their best to preserve their momentum to make the most efficient use of their 100 watts of power even though they want to keep moving most bike riders approach stop signs with extreme care if only because they know they usually have the most to lose in a collision 
Most cyclists approach stop signs with the caution they were taught in driver's ed. They slow down, they look left, they look right, and look left again. They make sure the way is clear and that they have the right of way before they proceed. Yet many, if not most, do all this while preserving some small amount of forward motion. This approach to stop signs is known as a rolling stop. stop sign law would seek to allow bike riders to treat stop signs as yield signs. It would, in effect, allow for rolling stops, making this common sense approach legal and in doing so encourage safe, sensible, and efficient bicycle transportation. There is no question as to the safety of the proposed law because it's based on a law that's been in effect for the last 27 years in Idaho, and Idaho's bike safety record is exceptional. Despite being a more rural state than Oregon, Idaho makes for a fair comparison because if Boise were a city in Oregon, it would be our second largest. It's important to note that neither Idaho law nor the proposed Idaho style stop law would allow a bike rider to blow through a stop sign. Blowing through a stop is reckless, dangerous, and disregards the rights of others. Under the Idaho stop law, the fine for this offense would be even higher than it is now. Here are some examples of how the Idaho stop sign law would work in practice. At a four-way stop with other vehicles present, the bike rider yields until he or she has the right of way. At a two-way stop with heavy cross traffic, the bike rider yields until it's safe to go. At a two-way stop with low visibility, the bike rider cannot be sure the way is clear. Therefore, the bike rider yields. At any intersection with the pedestrian present, the bike rider yields. The bike rider is allowed to roll through a stop only if the way is clear of cars and pedestrians, and only if the bike rider has a right of way. In all cases, the bike rider treats the stop sign as a yield sign. stop law would simply make it so that riding a bike would be every bit as safe as it is now, but more efficient, more enjoyable, and thus more viable as a clean, healthy, and low-impact form of transportation. Get everything. Do you have any questions about the law? My only question is, did they adapt the penalties in Oregon like they did? I haven't researched that yet, okay. but I believe they did. Because I, I think in practicality, especially in rural areas, it's probably a good idea, but I've seen a lot. Of, I've biked quite a bit in Portland and seen <laughs> some guys that are going way too fast and just blow through intersections one yeah. after another. Um, so I think this is going to give them a little bit more think they have the right to do it a little bit more but I think for most bikers that are paying attention it's probably going to be okay but mm -hmm. I'd like to see maybe some backup I don't it's too bad the police officers left from <laughs> earlier we might have been able to ask them yeah. but yeah I actually did email the police chief and asked if they can review you know any changes in you know crashes or behavior between cyclists and motorists uh, after the law it was enacted in um, January 1st. So th I think we're going to stay in touch with me about if there's anything they notice. But so far, they haven't followed up with, you know, any, any impacts. So but yeah, I've already been communicating with them to see if there's any impacts from this law. I, I would be wondering about the ratio of bicyclists to motorists in Idaho versus the bicyclists yeah. and motorists in Oregon. Yeah. And if you looked, it would have been the second city, but we're still, Portland was two and a half times the size. So. Well, yeah. And, and you know, and what's what's what might be safe for for one bicycle per ten thousand automobiles might not be as safe for a thousand bicycles for ten thousand automobiles. As long as they treat it as they understand, they still yield, as opposed yeah. to it doesn't give you the right to just blow through a stop sign. G given what I've seen of bicyclists and motorists and pedestrians, I think that's a very very large assumption. <laughs> Are you looking for some action on this? I was mostly just sharing that the law is uh, going to affect January 1st. And it's law, it's done. Uh, yep, yeah. and I guess keep me informed or the committee informed on if you, 
you know, have any concerns that you see on the street because it's, it's a new thing. So, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, it, it's one of those things that I think we're going to have to get used to. Mm -hmm. yep. Future agenda items, anyone? Hearing none, we stand adjourned.